changed in that regard as well. So the president then also directed that this matter be brought to the United Nations. And those of you who are familiar with the movie 13 Days will have seen Adlai Stevenson, who he was our ambassador to the UN, his very forceful presentation to the United Nations Security Council. 13 Days was a pretty good movie, quite accurate in portraying the danger and the president's cool leadership. My wife thought it'd be a better movie if Warren Beatty had been available to play me, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately that uh, wasn't to be. But in addition to the United Nations, we, as a, uh, demonstrating a belief in international law, Kennedy and the State Department, representatives from the State Department, not the President himself, presented our case to the little regional Western Hemisphere UN, so to speak, the Organization of American States in Washington. And with one abstention from a delegate to the OAS who could not reach his government in time to get instructions, the OAS unanimously voted to endorse and adopt Kennedy's plan for a blockade or a quarantine around the island of Cuba. That converted it into a regional security plan which the United Nations Charter permits so that we were certain to be following international law, the United Nations Charter, and that was important for a number of reasons, including winning support in world opinion, which proved later in the crisis to be very valuable, very important to us. Another way in which the management of that crisis differed from uh, the mood and attitude of today was that Kennedy communicated with Khrushchev about what was happening. Ultimately, those communications involve, evolved into a form of negotiation. Conventional thinking is you don't communicate with your adversaries, you don't negotiate with your adversaries, although I still invoke uh, the late uh, Prime Minister Rabin of Israel who said, of course I negotiate with my adversaries, who else would I negotiate with? But um, there is such a controversy today when uh, Senator Obama says that he's willing to sit down and talk with leaders of countries that don't like us very much, like Iran or Syria or maybe Cuba or maybe North Korea, and they say, well, that proves how naive he is. No, on the contrary. The naive people are those who flatly say no communications, no negotiations with those uh, uh, who don't like us. The details of those 13 days that followed, which historians still call the most dangerous 13 days in the history of mankind are all set forth in my book, so I'll mention only a few uh, tonight to uh, confirm uh, Bob's uh, point that uh, it was indeed a tense and dangerous time. Everybody's first uh, option, first choice among the options, was what the Air Force called a surgical airstrike. Sounded so good. Air Force planes swoop down, bomb the missile sites out of existence, fly away. You've just restored the status quo ante. Oh, no, you haven't. The, um, first of all, Kennedy, who was good at asking tough questions, and that was also one of my roles, asked them what were the, what were the odds of getting all the missiles and missile sites? And they said, well, maybe we'll get three quarters of them, 
that a quarter of those missiles could destroy half the United States and its population. That wasn't good enough. And then the Air Force said, in addition, we're not sending our planes over to Cuba unless we first bomb all of the surface-to-air missile sites that could shoot down our planes. And then we have to also bomb the airfields unless Soviet or Cuban bombers, while we're busily engaged in destroying missile sites, fly the 90 miles to uh, U.S. and uh, take out uh, Miami or most of Florida. And they said, we also have to bomb this, we have to bomb that. And after all the bombing, the length and breadth of the island, there will be chaos and we'll have to invade in order to uh, settle things down. Invasion, massive bombing, it's a lot more than a surgical airstrike. And so, the, and then another objection was raised, a moral objection by the president's brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who said, if we have a surprise airstrike on these missile sites, it's bound to kill innocent Cubans who are working to construct those uh, and install those weapons. And uh, it would be seen in history as Pearl Harbor in reverse except instead of Americans being the targets this time, they would be the attackers. And said Bobby, there has to be some form of notification so that innocent people can um, leave the area. The Air Force did not like that idea. They thought the weapons might be moved under cover, uh, camouflaged or under, into caves. So I was asked to draft a form of notification a, uh, a note to Khrushchev from Kennedy to be delivered by a high-level personal emissary. And then everybody around the table began to give me instructions on what conditions the note had to meet. Can't be, can't be uh, an ultimatum. Superpowers don't respond to the ultimatum. Can't have complicated re uh, requirements. Khrushchev would negotiate those for weeks and the missiles would be completed and ready to fire. Can't be overreaching on, for our side only or any survivors, if there were any, would blame us for starting the mankind's final war. Went back to my office, tried my best. I couldn't come up with a note that met all of those conditions. Of course, a notification that says pull those weapons out or we're going to bomb is an ultimatum. Of course it's one-sided. Of course it has complicated conditions. So when we gave up on the note, more people began to move to the other leading option that had been emerging during those first few days, and that was the option of a blockade. More passive, less likely to precipitate war more likely to put the ball into Khrushchev's court and let him decide whether he wanted to challenge the blockade, risk a war, or pull his missiles out and, and take his ships back. A blockade, said John McCone, a Republican uh, member of our group who was then director of CIA, is an act of war. And having been in the shipping business himself, he said, our allies will find that sending ships through the Caribbean when an act of war is taking place will triple or quadruple the insurance rates on those ships and they will be very unhappy about what we have done. The legal advisor in the State Department, later a brilliant professor of international law at Harvard, Abe Chase, said that uh, Instead of blockade, it should be a quarantine. Roosevelt had a quarantine the aggressor back in the 30s. This would be a quarantine against offensive weapons. We weren't trying to keep food out of Cuba. We weren't trying to keep gasoline out of Cuba. We weren't trying to keep medicine. We weren't trying to shut down the Cuban economy. We didn't want to suggest that it was a parallel to the blockade of West Berlin, which the Soviets, 
and their East German allies had uh, perpetrated in the late, f f or when it was the late 40s, um, and uh, we didn't want to suggest they might uh, have be justified to do it again. So it would instead be a selective quarantine, and uh, that seemed, given the steps we had taken to make our case to the Security Council, take have a regional plan in accordance with international law, we hoped that uh, the United States would not be uh, violating international law by means of that quarantine. And finally, uh, we called the president back because he also had maintained his schedule of commitments. Last week when Senator McCain said that there was a crisis in the country and the, his campaign, including the presidential debates, should be suspended, uh, I said it's strange when we face, we had a much, when we had a crisis uh, that threatened the actual destruction of the company, President Kennedy did not cancel the congressional campaign or anybody's plans to participate in it. And in fact, the very next day, Wednesday the 17th, flew up to Hartford, Connecticut to uh, keep a campaign commitment that he had made while the rest of us continued our meetings. And he came back and the meetings uh, resumed. Finally, uh, we called him back on <clears throat> what would have been uh, Friday the 19th from Chicago. He came back Saturday morning the 20th. I presented to him something that uh, it's in the book and I'm very proud of it, <clears throat> it's, which is a one-page memorandum, two paragraphs. The first paragraph was what I thought was the irrefutable case against the bombing and invasion option. And the second paragraph was what I thought was the irrefutable case in favor of the quarantine blockade accompanied by surveillance and diplomacy option. The president uh, decided on that second option in part because it was a limited beginning. You don't start out by going to the maximum. Pretty tough to draw back once you've done that. But if you start with a limited beginning, if it doesn't work, you can always uh, turn the, uh, the heat up. And so uh, on the evening of the 22nd, he first uh, called together the congressional leaders who had been in recess, he called them together for a meeting in the cabinet room and presented to them what had been decided and what, well first what had been discovered because nobody outside the XCOM, as we called our group, at that time knew about the Soviet missiles. And the congressional leaders, interestingly enough, went back to our first option, the bombing, an invasion. That they thought was the decisive kind of action that was required. You'd be surprised at some of the thoughtful members of Congress, congressional leadership who uh, who took that uh, position and thought that uh, what Kennedy thought was a more passive, careful, prudent approach would uh, would be the uh, the worst one. He then uh, went on the air, and I should interrupt for just one moment to say that the previous uh, about two or three days earlier. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, who did not like the uh, more passive approach, also demanded a meeting with the President, and in that meeting uh, showed some signs of revolt. We've never had a seven days in May in this country, but uh, we've never had uh, Joint Chiefs who were quite as belligerent as those that Kennedy had, had inherited, who were still serving in October 19. In 62, had he taken the advice of the Joint Chiefs, had he taken the advice of the congressional leaders, we now know that would have been the end of the country in all likelihood.
we discovered after the crisis was all over that the increased number of Soviet troops on the island of Cuba had been armed with tactical nuclear weapons and the authority to use them on their own initiative in the event of an American attack. So whether we had attacked by land, sea, or air, the Russians would have fired tactical nuclear weapons upon our forces and under the so-called rules of engagement in those days, the United States would have responded probably with tactical nuclear weapons only, but once both countries are on that escalator, they go up pretty swiftly to the exchange of strategic nuclear weapons which can eliminate an entire country. And the nuclear f radioactive fallout from those explosions carried by wind and water spreads throughout the entire planet until they turn it into uh, what the scientists call a nuclear desert. So it couldn't have been more serious. And the president, shortly after the meeting with the congressional leaders on Monday evening, October 22, went on nationwide television. Minutes before, Secretary of State Rusk handed a copy of the speech to the Soviet ambassador in Washington. The first hint the Soviets had of what we were going to do. An hour before, the uh, copies of the speech had been sent to every U.S. ambassador around the world, some of whom may have relatives here tonight, with instructions to present that speech to the head of government or head of state to whom they were accredited to look for their support and explain that our intentions were peaceful. Every day thereafter was a tense day. The blockade was put in place, the o backed by the OAS uh, resolution and a presidential executive order. At first we thought the uh, Soviet ships were stalling, maybe turning around. Then they again began to uh, head toward the um, barricade of destroyers that surrounded Cuba. On Friday evening, October 26, the only time in my life that I can tell you which day of the week particular events uh, occurred. On Friday evening, a letter, there had been some exchanges of messages, as I mentioned with Khrushchev, some initiated by Utant, the United Nations Secretary General. And a message came in from Khrushchev that clearly was personal. It came through a back channel that had been used before. We might talk about that during the Q&A because that's a fun uh, story. And this letter from Khrushchev, even though it was full of threats and denials, threatening that if the United States continued what Khrushchev called high seas piracy, that uh, all kinds of destruction could be visited upon uh, the U.S. and its interests. And denying that he had any offensive weapons in Cuba, I put them there for defensive reasons, he said, therefore they're defensive. We didn't quite buy that, nor, did we, uh, nor were we satisfied with his, the insistence in his letter that none of the ships steaming toward Cuba carried offensive weapons. But more bad news came in during that next day, October, Saturday, October 27, the really, what looked like it was the darkest day. CIA briefing began the, our session by saying that the uh, construction work on the sites had been completed and they looked like they were just about ready to uh, load and fire. The worst news was that our U-2 reconnaissance plane had been shot down, pilot killed, the only death of that crisis. The low-flying reconnaissance planes, which uh, I think uh, and Kennedy thought the Air Force wanted largely because they were provocative, were f had been fired upon by uh, 
Cuban uh, ground fire and uh, the uh, Soviet ship closest to the blockade was accompanied by a Soviet submarine. Were they going to shoot their way through the blockade? Well, we did not know then, but found out later in the most amazing series of meetings in the history of diplomacy, which was a series of reunions in between participants in the crisis among, from both the U.S. government, the Soviet government, and the Cuban government. We found out the, that, uh, I think from the captain himself of that submarine, that the submarine, that submarine had nuclear torpedoes. We had never heard of nuclear torpedoes. And said the captain, uh, when the United States destroyer was dropping depth charges, and when you're inside a submarine and depth charges uh, go off nearby, you shake and rattle like a marble in a tin can, and the crew pleaded with the captain to fire the, the uh, torpedo. Some kind of uh, Soviet bureaucracy had imposed a three-man signature rule. The captain had to sign off and agree, the deputy had to sign off and agree, and the political officer on board had to sign off and agree. The crew pleaded, the captain said, all right, I will sign. The deputy said, I'll sign. But the good communist uh, political officer said, no, I'm not going to authorize it until I'm authorized by Moscow. They're in a submarine way under the Caribbean with an American destroyer nearby. There was no way they could communicate with Moscow. So that good bureaucrat uh, of a political officer prevented uh, world destruction by uh, refusing to have that nuclear submarine uh, fired. Then also in the middle of all, we didn't know at the time about the nuclear torpedo, but in the, as we're sitting around the table trying to decide what to do about the first letter, a second letter comes in, and this one, though signed by Khrushchev, had clearly been drafted not by him personally, but by the, probably the military presidium or whatever uh, Soviet uh, uh, military group was in charge. They had probably learned about the letter of the previous night, did not like its uh, contents because it, beneath those denials and threats that I mentioned, there were some seeds of a possible uh, mutual agreement. No, this second letter was very stiff and harsh in tone and said they were doing nothing, taking nothing out, in effect, unless the United States took NATO missiles out of Turkey. Sounded reasonable, but they knew that uh, the United States could not do that by itself and they could not do it quickly, and time was of the essence. But uh, Kennedy knew that the NATO missiles in Turkey had been an insult and humiliation, provocation, because Russian vacationers on the Black Sea could look up while they're going to the beach and look at those missiles across the Black Sea pointing at them from Turkey. And Khrushchev was, had been determined to get them removed. Kennedy, interestingly enough, the previous year had been told by the Defense Department that these were outmoded uh, Acronistic uh, weapons, and that much more, a much more powerful, reliable deterrent would be to have Polaris submarines under the Mediterranean. They would be accurate, and they didn't, they couldn't be seen, so they weren't going to insult or provoke anybody. We debated which letter to respond to, because to take to insist that NATO remove weapons at the, because of a threat would end the whole basis for the alliance in those days, which was America's willing to risk its cities to protect Europe's cities. America's willing to take whatever blows it must take in order to go to war and defend NATO. Well, who would ever believe that we would do that if we took NATO missiles out of Turkey at the first sign of uh, a Soviet uh, threat.
tension mounted and the debate uh, heightened as to which letter to answer and how to answer. And then another message comes in. Turned out that a uh, Soviet, uh, excuse me, uh, that a, an American Air Force plane based in Alaska had uh, been sent out on an air sampling mission. We wanted to test to see if the Soviets were testing their nuclear weapons because the truth is we were testing our nuclear weapons at that very time and the air sampling would tell us that. But the navigational controls failed on this Air Force plane. Don't know why when you're at the North Pole there's only one direction to go. Uh, but it flew out over Siberia, over Soviet territory. The Soviets not so foolishly uh, thought this was the beginning of World War III and they scrambled their fighter jets to go up and meet this plane. That was the message that was handed in. There was dead silence around the table, stunned silence, and, excuse me ladies, but I'm quoting history, the President of the United States broke the silence saying, well, there's always one SOB who doesn't get the message. Well, what to do? Finally, uh, as the argument on the two letters continued, our wisest um, advisor, Tommy Thompson, a career ambassador who had been our ambassador in Moscow and knew Khrushchev personally, said he thought we should ignore the second letter and respond to the first letter. And Robert Kennedy and I both uh, spoke up and said yes, and I pointed out that there were some possible positives in that uh, meandering first letter, and we could emphasize those. And the president said to Bobby and me, go write, there, go draft a reply. And there's a little more to the dialogue than that, which I uh, quote in my book, including uh, the chairman of the chief of staff announcing that the chief's uh, recommendation was that we uh, start bombing in two days followed by an invasion, to which Bobby Kennedy sarcastically like said, well, now that's a surprise. So Bobby and I went to my office a few steps down the room, and it was the toughest letter I ever wrote in my life. If I made a mistake, what would happen? The cabinet room in those days was not what it is today. I'm told today it's a reinforced concrete bunker. Not then it wasn't. We knew that uh, if my letter angered Khrushchev or my ignoring his...